Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Marketing and Advertising Club, I would like to welcome you all to this year's Summit for Marketing and Advertising Careers. My name is Dan Gottschalk. I am the president of MAC. Um, and I'm just very excited to see such a great turnout for our eighth annual MAC SMAC. I swear it gets better and better every year. This is awesome. So I would like to extend a thank you to all of our guest speakers joining us today. Um, thank you guys for taking your time out of your day to travel here, share your experiences and your wisdom with all of us. I know we're all looking forward to it. Um, we'll be hearing from industry leaders and professionals from Love Lexi, Architure, Digitas, Matter Communications, Spark Foundry, uh, Truly Seltzer, C Space, New England Patriots, and we've also got Arnold Worldwide, Planet Fitness, and Keurig Dr. Pepper. So we got lots of powerful leaders and speakers with us today. I'm really looking forward to that. Next, I would like to recognize Mac's board of directors. Um, first up, we've got Nolan Duffy, our vice president. Autumn Frazier, our director of events and fearless leader through today's entire process. Um, Emily Alberigo, she is our director of our chapter of the American Marketing Association. We've got Ian Lidster, he is our treasurer. Emma Guagnini, she is our secretary. Erica West, she is our director of outreach. Lindsay Murphy, our director of web communications. And last but certainly not least, our trio, marketing trio of Maddie's, Maddie Fleming, director of marketing, Maddie Pomeroy, and Maddie Nerdin, our marketing associates. And I would also like to give a big shout out to the rest of our AMA team and our student ambassadors today. You guys have put in so much work this entire semester to make everything in Mac run smoothly, including awesome events like this. <laughs> Additionally, and most importantly, we would love to thank our faculty advisor, Diane Devine. She is a godsend to us all. Um, None of this would be possible without her. She makes everything with Mac and AMA run smoothly and gives a great experience for all students who want to join. In addition to Diane, I would also like to thank our Dean, Lucy Gilson, our Marketing Department Chair, Ludwig Bestieler, along with Carrie Rosalia and Paul College's faculty and staff, especially Tom Trella, Kevin Poliquin, Sherry Cannon, and Shana Sylvia. Thank you all for your help and support throughout this year with MaxMac. This event is made possible by Peter T. Paul Innovation Fund, the Dean's Office, and the Marketing Department. So we are pleased to present a very full schedule of events today. We just wrapped up a successful and exciting round of our Real World Business Challenge, uh, hoping to hear about the winners shortly after our panels. And we also hosted the UNH Marketing and Advertising Career Fair. And special thanks to all the companies that came out to speak to the students today, and especially Leslie Smith, who helped orchestrate the entire event. Uh, it's almost time for our keynote presentation with Meg Smith. Um, it'll be followed by two panels, first with industry leaders from 2 to 3, and then industry professionals from 3 to 4, which will go right into our um, networking Reception afterwards out in the Great Hall at 4 o'clock, so I hope to see you guys all there, too. Oh, and that is where we will be presenting the, winter, the winners of the Real World Business Challenge. Okay, now I am pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for today and UNH alum, Meg Smith. Meg is the founder and CEO of Love Lexi, a lingerie brand committed to empowering women and abolishing the idea of the perfect body. So being a fairly young brand originally launching back in just 2022, Love Lexi's energy is extremely high. Meg, and her, Meg is leading her devoted team towards building a community of positive, comfortable, and confident women that embodies the principles of our theme today, which is igniting empowerment, inclusivity, and positivity. She did not just start a brand, but a movement that will hopefully last for generations to come. So without further ado, please welcome Meg Smith. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Every time I come back to campus, it just gives me all the good feels. I'm Meg Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of Love Lexi. Today, we're going to be talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as empowerment and my story. But there are two really big, important takeaways I want you to have beyond that today. I want every one of you here 
to fully believe and understand that anyone can do anything. Like, let's just take this moment in for a minute. Decades ago, I was sitting exactly where you sat. Well, actually, not exactly, not in this facility. But I remember hearing stories and reading about and watching on TV these inspiring entrepreneurs building these big brands and communities. And it was so aspirational, yet at the same time, it seemed so far away, like so out of reach, almost as if there was a big glass wall in front of me and I was just looking in from the outside. Yet here I am today, a small town girl from New Hampshire, without a million followers, without being a celebrity, and I'm so proud to be standing behind this beautiful brand and powerful community that we've built. Which leads me into my second takeaway, which is confidence, which is a big word we use in Love Lexi. I'm not just talking about confidence in your body, which is incredibly important, feeling confident in your skin and how you carry that through you each day, but also the confidence to believe that you're capable of achieving your wildest dreams or your smallest goals. Confidence has the power to change the trajectory of your life. I've witnessed that firsthand and it's pretty incredible. And so beyond everything that you learned today, I hope that you leave this presentation with this newfound perspective of how important having confidence in yourself is, not only in your body, but just in yourself and your worth and what you're capable of. So for those of you who don't know my story, I grew up during a time when, quote unquote, the perfect body was plastered on billboards, magazine covers, fashion show runways. And of course that took a toll on my body image. I'm sure a lot of you can relate. A lot of millennials and Gen Z were, you know, understood and had to live through that image of what beauty was supposed to look like, this unattainable standard. It affected my relationship with food. I clung to calorie counting books. I excessively exercised, always trying to conform to and look like and be like this idea of beauty. Gen Z and millennials, as I had mentioned, were the most affected. We've come a long way. When you think of the body positivity movement, the body image movement, there's a lot of inspiring content on social media today, right? But simultaneously, there are now apps, as you know, that can alter the way your body looks in a video. There are filters that can completely change the way your face looks. So while we're taking step forwards, we're also taking steps backwards which is really discouraging, but also an opportunity for us to continue to step in as a brand and make a bigger positive impact. As a mom of two young girls, what's also alarming to see is how social media is affecting Generation Alpha, children under the age of 13, which if we have time later in this presentation, I'll give you all a little sneak peek of something else we're working on to impact that younger generation. So back to my body image issues that I was experiencing at the time, it was an internal struggle despite having a husband who made me feel beautiful and confident, there was no outside validation that was gonna change how I felt about my reflection and in my skin. I had two babies, my body transformed even more. And then I was under the assumption that breast implants were going to be the key to unlocking this level of confidence that I never had. So I got them in and after about three months, I started to develop these really strange symptoms, which started as, vision issues, light sensitivity, slurred speech, and brain fog, which over the course of four years developed into on and off autoimmune diseases, Graves' disease to be one of them, hyperthyroidism, locked joints, heart palpitations, panic attacks, among many other things. This is when my health really started to decline. And this is also the time when I hit rock bottom that I have what I call my self-love revelation. I had to go through these things to reach this new level of confidence and have this new perspective in life. I learned about breast implant illness, which at the time I just didn't really believe was a real thing. I, I, maybe it was a state of denial. But as I entered in these private Facebook groups with hundreds and thousands of women, which was at the time, which now has over half a million, sharing the same stories, same symptoms, that's when I realized it was likely the culprit. So in fall of 2020, I had my explant, I had them removed. Ironically enough, all of my blood work normalized after three months and I've never felt healthier in my skin, symptom free. Um, but that's besides the point. But I never felt as confident as I did in my skin as I do today when the implants came out, despite scars, despite what my body looked like after the procedure, I've never felt more beautiful in my skin. And that's when I set on this journey to search for a bra, right? 
I had a branding and marketing agency at the time. I never thought I would be in this category. But here I was searching for a really pretty bra that would make me feel beautiful and feminine and confident in my skin. I was left so frustrated because what I was finding was the really pretty, sexy looking bras that were very lacy gave me cup gaps and wire digs. They were incredibly uncomfortable. And as an active mom, I wanted something that was comfortable and functional. On the contrary, I had you know, the basic t-shirt bra or the athleisure bra, but that didn't fill that desire that I had to just wear something that was gonna make me feel pretty. What was an unexpected finding during that time was the disconnect I felt when I was shopping with those brands. Shopping for bras is an emotional shopping experience. It's not like shopping for shoes or sneakers. These are intimates. It's the closest thing you wear to your skin. So never mind the journey I was going through. I was really on this emotional shopping experience and I felt very disconnected. I felt like an order number, just like it was a very transactional. I didn't feel seen and heard. And what's interesting about this desire that I had for a pretty bra, it's not really just personal preference. There is a psychological connection between pretty undergarments and the confidence of a woman. I'm a bit of a neuroscience geek, so I really dove deep into that to understand like what is this drive to wear something that's so pretty. I have so many mom friends who say, oh, I'm just wearing my ugly mom bra, as you call it. But that's because a lot of their pretty bras are tucked in the back of their dresser, collecting dust because they're not functional, they don't really fit well, and they're saving them for the next special occasion. I had no premonition that I was going to start a bra brand up until September 14th of 2020. I'll rem I will never forget the feeling. It takes me right back to that moment at 1.30 in the morning when I woke up from a deep sleep, eyes wide open, bloodshot, and I was like, I'm gonna create what's missing. So I trekked downstairs for a cup of coffee at 1.30 in the morning, which is probably not what you should do in the middle of the night, went down into my office, and as a marketer, I also understood that I had to validate this idea. Like, is this just something that I'm missing, or are other women wanting this as well? So I inserted myself back into these private Facebook groups and into forums to hear what consumers were talking about. I even joined in on these other private um, forums and these other groups outside of Facebook to just listen to the consumer. And it was validation after validation. And that's when the path just continued to clear itself. It's like all the stars aligned. That's when I really stepped into my purpose. Like I could feel it in my soul, this is my calling. That's when the universe paved the way and it was like, Meg, you go. You go impact the lives of women. You go revolutionize an industry. Women deserve to have a special emotional connection to the thing that they wear closest to their skin. You should not be an order number and you shouldn't just be a transaction. And that's when we realized this opportunity was so much bigger than just solving for product. A little bit of a side note here, some of the biggest conglomerates in the market just so happen to be the culprits of negative body image for decades. I mean, sure, brands should have the right, and I respect them for trying to reinvent themselves, but how empowering is it for women in a community to grow on this foundational level that's set on letting them be seen and heard and celebrated in a very genuine, meaningful way? It's always fun to have these ideas though, right? It's so fun and dreamy. It seems so glamorous and exciting, but then you actually have to go build it. Then you actually have to bring it to life, and that's the hard part. What worked in my favor was my marketing and branding background. I had built a marketing and branding agency for a decade. I was a CMO of a, an organic cosmetics brand. I was the head of marketing of a sports media company, and I was kind of decided to start side hustling at the time. I started to build out these really important foundational brand pillars. You know, who are our customer persona groups? What are these segments of women? What are their lifestyles? What are they talking about? What are they frustrated about? What are their pain points? And what's working for them and what's not working for them? At the same time, we were building out our brand identity, our brand positioning, brand messaging, and cohesively all of these pieces together came together and married into this beautiful brand and again community that I'm so proud of today. At the same time of all this brand building was intensive market research, which was absolutely critical. Everyone would say, Meg, it's such a saturated, noisy market. Some really big players are in that category. You sure about that? Well, it's like, sure. But why are consumers still so frustrated? What was interesting during our competitive research was also understanding that a lot of brands had a singular focus when it, was, when it came to product. 
You know, brands would really check one box in terms of these are going to be really beautiful, sexy, um, stunning lingerie pieces, bras that have elements of lace to it, but their focus wasn't comfort or function. Or you have your everyday athleisure basic t-shirt bra, sure you could wear it all day long. It was comfortable, it, it solved for some fit pain points depending on the niche size system, but why can't we marry the best of both worlds? If I find these product legends, masters of product, you can't tell me that there's not a way that we can check more than just one box for the consumer. What was also interesting during our research was understanding that there's so much smoke and mirrors in all industries, but even particularly in the intimates category. You know, when we stepped into the market, a lot of the brands that had over 5% market share had been in the, the category for six to eight years and have really established themselves with this identity, whether they were an ethical brand or sustainable or community driven. But what was so interesting when you actually dive deep to listen to what their community is saying and what consumers are saying, why was there still such a disconnect? There's a huge opportunity for us to build something very genuine here. Additionally, consumers were still feeling just like order numbers, feeling transactional, another huge opportunity. One thing that we did back during the brand build phase that we're still doing every single day is listening. Listening to the consumer. This is what's going to continue setting us apart at the foundational level. Although we're still small, we're a year and a half into business, if you could see the amount of emails and DMs that we receive from women that are crying happy tears after the transaction has already happened, they feel seen and heard in a very special way because we're listening to them. We hear them, we know what they're going through, we know what their questions are, we know what their wishes and dreams are and what's not working for them and how we can step up and, and serve them and step into their lives in a way that's more meaningful than just the bra itself that's making them feel beautiful. How are we listening? Well, you have your forums, we're in Reddit, we're on different, you know, in a slew of blog posts we read and articles, we're in the comments section, we're digging deep into the rabbit hole of comments on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, we're in our competitors, on our competitors' websites, reading the reviews. What are they saying? What are they liking that the brands are doing and what are they not liking? This is when I, like, I literally morphed into a sponge. When I was rehearsing this, my daughters were giggling because they just were picturing SpongeBob and they thought it was hilarious. They said I should like act like SpongeBob, but I won't. Um, <laughs> I, I morphed into a sponge. I could not absorb enough information. I was knocking on the doors of as many mentors as I could. And I'm talking the top developers, designers, and executives in this category. And what was an amazing thing to see is that when I led with my story and my purpose and my mission, most of them opened their doors. And they wanted to help and they wanted to educate me. And what's pretty incredible is a bunch of them are now on our marketing, our product team um, today for Love Lexi. I listen to podcasts endlessly and I still do today. I'd go on these podcast walks every single morning. I was reading blogs, I was reading books, I was reading articles. There is so much information out there. I had so many people that still come up to me today and they're like, how did you like start a bra brand? Did you go to fashion school? Were you at FIT in New York? And it just goes to show when it back to my original point that anyone can do anything. I have consumed more than I thought I had the capacity in my brain to consume in a year and a half and I'm still learning today. But when you see our product and you feel it on the body and you become a part of the community, you'll understand that everything that I'm saying up here has come to fruition. And you have to be hungry to learn and you have to be listening. We've built a movement. It's not just a, bra a brand. I mean, sure, the product speak f speaks for itself. It's incredible. I mean, we have our product team of legends in the industry. It's a beautiful product, but beyond the product, beyond making women cry happy tears when they put our collection on, is that Love Lexi is revolutionizing the industry because we're creating a space where women feel seen, they feel heard, they feel celebrated, and they feel comfortable in their skin. This is an intimates brand that's made for women by women. Talk about empowerment. And a lot of people also, I think I had two people today ask me where Love Lexi came from, and we're confused that my name was Meg. <laughs> Butterflies were always very symbolic in my life, a very positive symbol. And as I looked more into the symbolism, it represents confidence and beauty and transformation. A lot of the things that embody Love Lexi today. So then I dug deeper. The largest butterfly in the world is the Queen Alexandra of Papua New Guinea. I also knew that our collection would be considered love letters to your body. So 
knowing I wanted my brand to be two names and marrying all these elements together, that's where we came up with Love Lexi. It also rhymes with sexy. It also has the two X's. I mean, I'm telling you, I went way too deep into this, but I won't waste too much time. Even the logo, this is more than a logo. This is a symbol that represents our purpose and why we exist. The intricacy of all the interlocking hearts represents lace and just that element of beauty and design and aesthetic that we bring to our collection. As you can see, those are all intersecting hearts, which hearts representing self-love and confidence, and the interlocking itself representing community, which is really the core and the heartbeat of what Love Lexi is. Our collection really speaks for itself. You have to try her on to understand why and how we brought this to fruition in a way. It's not just a regular bra. It is engineered to perfection to solve all common fit pain points of our niche sizing currently. It's comfortable, it's functional, you can wear it all day long. It's sustainable, buttery soft, super soft lace, lace, no wire digs. I mean, our collection is incredible. We have these three styles at launch, but we currently have three more in development, new colorways. This is gonna be a very, very big year for us, but our community is inspiring the evolution of our collection, which makes us so excited. And I remember hearing this quote when I first started Love Lexi, and this guy had said, if you're not completely embarrassed by the first product you launched, then maybe you didn't do something right. Which is like pretty incredible in hindsight when I look back, because yes, we are making minor improvements as we go. We're making little iterations for this new replenishment coming in April, but it's pretty exciting to see straight out of the gate that we've created something that works and that make women feel celebrated in comfort, truly. We also have our Dear Body Crewnecks, which has been an incredible brand awareness um, message. If I was wearing one right now, you wouldn't really be able to read the words because they'd be backwards. But when you're looking in the mirror, it says, Dear Body. It's a message to yourself. It's for you. That reminder to stop comparing yourself to others, to just respect your body and the skin that you're in. Um, it's a beautiful message. And we have an incredible ethical factory that's behind the development and construction as well, um, which is a whole nother keynote, I could talk about our, our team beyond the internal team, it's just amazing group of people that believe in what we're building. Um, without going too much in the weeds of all of this, um, again, what, what differentiates us? We don't have a patented product, but we have enough of these that make us pretty unstoppable. Our impact that goes beyond the product, up until date, because we've been such a small team, has really been the communication and the intimate conversations that we're having with our community even beyond the transaction. We're having email conversations, we're talking in DMs. I mean, these are intimate conversations. I've even given out my cell phone number to a few who have called and we've had conversations on the phone. So at a very small scale, we've made that impact. But what's exciting about this year moving forward is we're now in a position where we're garnering these partnerships with psychologists, body image coaches, thought leaders who are really stepping up and we're going to really build out this hub and be a resource for women that inspires them in a way that has nothing to do with the product at all. They feel even more served by the brand. Um, engineering, as I had mentioned, I have to give so much credit to my team. They, they are everything. I mean, bras couldn't be, <laughs> bras are the most, one of the most complicated products to produce. I couldn't have picked anything more challenging, um, but we've really nailed down the engineering. They know what they're doing. They've been in the industry for 35 years, um, which I think is a real differentiator because they've taken experiences that they had with some of the largest conglomerates in the market and they're bringing their knowledge to Love Lexi in a way to say like let's fix what's broken. So it's a very interesting perspective that they have. Of course our community, we say we're community driven and we don't just say that. We really are bringing our community in and giving them seats at the table. We're making them feel a part of a brand in a way that hasn't been done before. And if you were to actually reach out to anyone in our community, I guarantee you they would say that. I've never had a connection to a brand in this way before. I could do an entire keynote, which I have before in the past, on sustainability and ethics. All of our packaging is 100% biodegradable and compostable. Even the shipping tape that's on the outside, the tissue paper that's on the inside. Our materials are used with sustainable elements, although we're gonna continue to improve that as we learn and grow and scale. Our factory, as I had said, has all the certifications. Our factory is in Sri Lanka, and we're working on a, a second partnership with a factory in Peru. Um, having these ethical certifications are non-negotiable for us, and these humans are absolutely incredible who stand behind the product. 
and my, my founder story is a bit of a differentiator, and I'll be honest with you. When I was launching and building Love Lexi, I was so apprehensive to share my story. It made me feel very vulnerable. I mean, there was a lot of people in my network who didn't even know that I altered my body in any which way. It wasn't very obvious, I stayed covered up, but I was really putting myself out there to be judged and opening myself up with like a book, which is a, um, kind of a scary thing to do, but I'm so glad in hindsight that I did because it has allowed me to garner this really intense emotional relationship with my community. Sorry, I need a tissue. All good. Wanna get me one? <laughs> Let's just be real. Everyone who's sitting in here right now, no matter what you identify with, we're all human beings. There has been, I'm sure, at some point in your life, whether it was a moment in a day, whether it was weeks, whether it was months, whether it was a few years, where you struggled with body image a little bit, or you questioned your self-worth, or you, you, oh, sorry, that distracted me, my own video. <laughs> um, we're all human. And so my story, going through the ringer and hitting rock bottom and, and experiencing all the things that I did resonates with our community in so many different ways, in all different segments of women, women who have never even thought about altering their bodies. It's that emotional connection that it's almost, you know, when you think about it from the business perspective, it's icing on the cake because the fact that we have that special bond with our community, there, it increases their lifetime value drastically, which if you look at our customer base right now, our retention rate is so high, which is incredible at scale to see, see how that's gonna continue to improve. And it really, a lot of times, the first purchase is because they were first drawn to my story, not necessarily the product. And I have some aspiring entrepreneurs come to me and say, I haven't really had like a tragic moment in my life or any um, breakthrough experience that I'd be able to like shape a brand story around. Like what if I don't have a story? And I just wanted to make a point to say, you don't have to have a moment like that or an experience in your life to um, you know, pursue these big dreams or this venture that you're, you're thinking about. It really comes down to your why. Like why do you exist? Because then you can shape a story around that why. And let's just kind of shift into empowerment real quick. Having a celebrity status, having a million followers, living in New York or LA, these are not prerequisites for success. Again, I'm living proof standing up here today. I had people early on when I first started to trickle little hints about building a bra brand on social media pre-launch, they were like, oh, Meg, that's so cute. You're starting a bra brand? That sounds nice. You know, and that's the funny thing about big vision sometimes is no one can really understand what's in your mind and the kind of impact you want to make. I even had a conversation with a private equity investor around the time that we launched, which don't ask me why I was speaking with private equity that early. It was an introduction that we had at the time. And this investor is actually connected to um, a very large conglomerate in the same category. And I remember what he said, I'll never forget it. He actually used the names Kim Kardashian and Rihanna and their celebrity as a measure of my probability of success. Like he was like looking down on me like, oh, you cute little thing down there, like good luck. That's, you, you live in New Hampshire, like you, you, know, you don't have millions of followers. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a beast in this category, good luck. Like don't, almost like don't spend too much time on that. What I love the most is he actually reached back out about six months ago to connect. It's the best. But you know, you just stay focused, you believe in yourself, and you keep going, which is exactly what I did. And it sounds cliche, I know you've heard this before, but the only thing that's standing in your way is yourself. You are your biggest roadblock, you are your biggest cheerleader. We have had so many roadblocks and hurdles in moments through tears where I've questioned if I have the strength and ability and energy to keep moving forward, but you do. When it's so passion driven and it's a movement that's in your soul, you just persevere and you learn how to keep adapting. You get over, you work, we work around, you break through, and you're gonna experience those wins that keep you going. And you keep finding that light that keeps you going. A lot of people will say, oh, sure, Meg, that's easy to say, what about capital? I understand that, you know, depending on your demographic, 
there are different areas where you have easier access to capital and not. But at the end of the day, capital should not be what stops you from pursuing your big dreams. There are resources. There's crowdfunding, there are SBA loans, small business loans. You could do a friends and family raise, small angel investor raise. I mean, you can make it happen. I'm, I'm in one of the most capital intensive industries. The capital can be there. It is so hard to find. It's not just gonna show up on your doorstep. You gotta work for it and grind, but it should not be a reason that stops you. So how do we empower our community? Well, I think we've answered a lot of that already, um, but our community is actually being invited to some of our product development meetings. We're actually bringing them in. We wanna hear their votes on new colorways, new styles. We want them to be a part of the evolution of the collection. We want them to know that their voices matter and they feel that. As I had mentioned before, if you were to reach out to anyone in our community base, they would say that they feel a part of a brand in a way they never have before. Even beyond the opportunities that we're giving our community to step in and be a part of our brand, we're empowering them to redefine beauty in their own way. We're empowering them to stop comparing themselves. We're inspiring and empowering them to lead a better life where they feel valued and they feel worthy. And I'm telling you, the amount of women that I make cry in a week is incredible. And I'm talking keyword here, happy tears, because they feel beyond the product. They just feel so moved and it kind of opens their eyes into understanding their worth, what matters most in life. It's, it's a really beautiful thing when you just see it all come to fruition. And again, with our partnerships with these psychologists, body image coaches, thought leaders, we're going to be able to continue impacting our community in bigger ways now that we have more resources, right? It's so hard when it's just like Meg behind the scenes, like I'm customer service at lovelexi.com, I'm press at lovelexi.com, you know, that's been the last year and a half up until now, which is an incredible thing, but it's only gonna allow us to make this a top priority as we scale and grow our resources, um, and we're never gonna lose sight at the power of our community. Well, how do we empower our team? You know, my director of product development, she has worked for, I mean, you name the brand, she's worked for them. And she's had this one idea, and I, I can't share it yet because it hasn't launched yet. And it's just actually a detail on one of the bras, but she's had this idea that she has brought to the table for all of these other brands she's worked for. And they shut her down. Yeah, it is not, you know, like we have our vision. You're just, you're just working for us. It's, it's, you know, it's not really relevant to us. She brought that and proposed it and kind of pitched it to me in a meeting and my eyes started to water. I just couldn't believe that she had first of all been turned down for all these years, for decades, but also that I have the power to give her the opportunity to bring it to life. And I'm talking a small but really beautiful special detail. That's just one example of many of how I sure, I can have a vision of how I wanna grow this brand, what I want the designs to look like, how I want social media to look, but I really truly believe in success will be greater when you allow more minds to come to the table and share ideas and actually use those ideas. You can make bigger impact that way. And I've seen it happen firsthand, but it also like fills my soul when I see them feeling so good to be a part of something so exciting. I want Love Lexi to be, and I know she will be, the brand that eventually everybody wants to work for because of the culture, because of how employees feel. They don't even feel like employees. They feel like a pillar of the executive team. Everyone deserves to have a voice in this life, right? We're all working so hard. We all have such unique perspectives. Um, so I'm really excited to have the opportunity to, um, again, be a platform for some of these designers and even interns to share their ideas and let them, let them run with it. I won't get into the weeds of all this text, no one, no one wants that, but um, integrity is incredibly important to me and that's when I made the decision out of the gate to like share my personal journey and that kind of set the stage to how we talk about everything with Love Lexi. Initially I was like, I wanna like look like I'm this like really big cool brand, you know, and you're like, and then quickly that shifted to actually no, I wanna show everybody that bras and panties have taken over my entire house. My entire basement, there's, that is our warehouse, right? We have a bedroom upstairs that's one of our fulfillment rooms now. This, you know, it, it, that transparency resonates with the community, it's real. 
You know, I, I, I'm often compared to Sarah Blakely, which I take as a huge compliment, but it's those early days, the early grind, where my daughters are in the fulfillment room putting stickers on packages and my husband is like stamping boxes and folding boxes. I mean, it's like, it's a full family affair here. Um, but it's beautiful because when I share clips of that with our community, they just feel a part of the brand in a really special way. It's, it's a really interesting thing to, to see um, the impact of and something that we're gonna continue to shine through as we grow and scale, no matter what size we are. Respect is a non-negotiable, non-negotiable. Whether it's a shipping carrier, whether it's a supplier, our factory workers, our team, our community members, we have respect for all people. Um, and I'll just keep it simple like that. Again, a non-negotiable in terms of our values and who we bring into the team as our team expands. Community, we've already covered that. We are community driven. Um, we want to win with you. Like as we grow and scale and build this beautiful beast, we wanna give you opportunities to feel a part of it in bigger ways, which we will be sharing in the coming year of what that actually looks like when I say things like that. Sustainability, as I had mentioned, and we're continuing to improve our sustainability in terms of like the actual materials that we're using. We repurpose the leftover materials from bra production to make matching panties. So when you see the panties on our website, I never actually really wanted to launch with panties. We actually were trying to keep all of that lace from ending up in the landfill. So naturally, it made sense to make a matching set. Our wash bags are made of leftover mesh from bra production. We've partnered with a downcycling organization. And we're launching a program this year to downcycle your old bras. I mean, how many of you have just bras sitting in your dresser that's in the back? And most of them are probably the pretty bras because none of them feel good. Right? But we don't want those ending up in landfill. So we have a really incredible program we're excited to launch this year. Um, and a lot of other efforts on the sustainability side that you'll be seeing roll out. Quality is very important to us. It's one thing to make a pretty bra. It's another thing to source high quality materials, have really great uh, members on your product team. I mean, our focus is not margins. We have great margins but we're not going to sacrifice and take shortcuts, which a lot of brands tend to do when it comes to building a, a, a quality undergarment. And that's what you can feel when you put Love Lexi on. You can tell that it is constructed with really beautiful, high quality materials. Our community deserves that. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, something we highly value. Now, if I were to like call anyone out here to see if you could really differentiate, if you could explain the the, the true difference between inclusion and diversity. I'd love to hear it because in my early days of building Love Lexi, I knew like as a human being, these were values that I wanted to shine through the brand. But when it came to diversity, equity, and inclusion, I was like, well, how are those actually differentiated? And, and what does that actually look like? It's one thing to say you care about those things, but what are, what are the proactive ways we can actually um, make that shine through is a true value that we're practicing within the company. I loved this visual when I was like really trying to understand diversity and inclusion. Multiple identities, right? You have diversity over here, multiple identities within an organization. Whereas inclusivity is when you take all of the perspectives and all the views of those multiple identities and have them help thrive and grow an organization together, make them feel seen and make them feel heard in all of their unique different ways. I love the analogy about diversity is compared to being served a plate of food. So it's as if I went around this entire room and you were all served a plate of food. That's diversity. Imagine if I served you a plate of food and then I said, you can eat that, but you can also come back to the kitchen with me and you can help like craft the menu and help me cook the meals as well. I really love that analogy and it, it helps shape how we grow our team and the, the internal culture of our business. Equity, of course, is giving the equal opportunity for our team, which we have clearly done if you talk to our product team in terms of the opportunities for growth that we've given them. With our interns, I don't have our interns like inputting data in Excel all day long. I give them fun, challenging product, projects to challenge themselves and give them the opportunity to keep growing and feel excited to eventually potentially become a part of the Love Lexi team full time. There's a lot of things we're doing behind the scenes, but between diversity and equity and inclusion, empowerment in our values, all together these create the culture of Love Lexi that really garner a sense of belonging. 
Has anyone here of woke washing? Raise your hand if you've heard of woke washing. I mean, I guess it's a similar concept to, um, you know, the smoke and mirrors. It's as a, you know, a lot of brands today say that they value diversity, equity, and inclusion. But when you lift up the hood, none of that really makes sense. They're not actually practicing those values. And so it's more important than ever as a brand to not just say we care about these things because we feel like we have to say them, but actually be practicing them. So diversity, equity, and inclusion for the consumer. It's interesting when you think of like inclusive sizing. So let me just share with you our sizing strategy and why we're currently AA to C. My product team taught me when they've worked with all of those big conglomerates in the market that typically in product development, they'll take one size for this example, let's use a 34C. They'll fit it and construct it on their fit model to perfection. And then they grade and scale that size across their entire size offering. Well, the issue with that and why consumers are frustrated on either end of that spectrum is because a bra for a double A body is not the, can't be the same bra for a double D. The fit pain points for each size range are actually very, very different. It can't be the same bra. That's the inexpensive way to do it so that you don't take a, date, a dent in your margin. But that's where we started to solve for fit and engineering behind the scenes and how we think about expanding our sizes. It made sense to launch with AA to C because of my personal story, but it also gave us the opportunity to enter the market and nail down the fit of that size range as we open up the opportunity to expand into larger cup sizes incrementally, which is what we're doing right now. We are currently developing D cup behind the scenes. Models, for example, that's, that's another tricky one. You know, in the early days pre-launch, we didn't have a lot of brand awareness yet to be getting in generating user generated content, right? To have our community members be sending us pictures of them in their undergarments. So when we were looking at modeling agencies and what our options were, unfortunately it was, it was really challenging to find like real bodies. We got very lucky and it took us a lot of time to find some of the beautiful models that we have on our website now that do have real bodies and have their stretch marks. What was wild to me is that the photographer at one of our first big photo shoots, she works with two other really big brands in the same category. After she took the pictures, she came up to me and asked, okay, so what parts of this do you want me to Photoshop? She's like, how much of this do you want me to learn? Like, and she started talking in this language that I was like, wait, what? Like, what, what are you talking? I don't want you to Photoshop anything. No, no, this is, what, this is what we're trying to accomplish here. And it's unbelievable because that's how they did it in the other photo shoots with the other brands that she worked for. Um, so I'm kind of tail spinning here, but when it comes to our models and inclusivity, our band sizes are actually larger than some of the other niche sized brands in our market. So if you look at some others, we have bands that go up to size 40 and we are expanding beyond that as we continue to raise capital and grow as a brand. Um, in my dream world, Love Lexi would be for every body, for every single body, every size. I mean, realistically, you know, you need some capital to do that. So we're very thoughtfully expanding as we go. And the same goes with influencer seating today. It's so important for us to, to sort out just the real bodies, real everyday women. We want a woman who's just like in her kitchen with a messy bun or in her living room in her small apartment. You know, it's so easy to look for this like Instagram worthy content and make everything look so, um, I don't know, conformed, but that's boring. Um, and so it's really how we tie it into every which way that then reflects onto our community and then they feel included in a part of something really special. Diversity, equity, and inclusion internally. How are we thinking about this? Well, if you look at our advisory board members, our whole board, it's very diverse. But that's not like why we set it up to be that way. So it just looks like diverse is all these multiple identities. I'm very proud of that. But what's even more amazing is how much of their voice they bring to the table, how much value each of them individually bring. Again, if you were to take a phone and call up any of my advisors, they would be so excited and fired up to share how they're involved with the brand and company. Not just to sit on a board to be like, this is a diverse company. It's, they add a lot of value. And as we continue to grow and expand our team, that is top of mind. 
And not only when you think about our board, but also when we think about every decision we make in the company in general. We approach everything with a sense of empathy. Like how is this decision going to affect somebody else within the company, outside of the company? A really tricky subject right now is like social action, right? That could mean one of many different things, but for us in particularly, breast implant illness. That's my story. I've had to turn down some recent opportunities where I wanted to be interviewed, be on a panel, be on an IG Live as an explant advocate. And that's really tricky for me because sure, breast, in, breast implant illness is a real thing, but we have to be very sensitive about how we show up and talk about that issue. There are women in our community who have implants currently and they feel fine but they also deserve to feel celebrated in our collection. We have breast cancer survivors, breast cancer warriors who have had mastectomies and had reconstruction and have implants. I don't want Love Lexi to put on this like fear factor that those implants are very toxic. They're gonna make you sick, take them out. That doesn't make sense for our brand. So there's been this challenging journey to navigate of how do we show up for the explant community, which is growing substantially, it's mind blowing, the amount of explants that are happening. How can we show up for them, but not in a voice of advocacy, but more so to say, we are a sisterhood. We are a resource for you. We are here to celebrate you, rather than a megaphone just yelling at everybody to take out their implants. That doesn't make sense for us. And it's very important to walk that fine line and make the right decisions with this empathetic vision with Love Lexi. It's a challenging one, but it's really important. And so far, we're doing it right. And these are the types of questions we ask ourselves. You know, is this related to our brand? Does this reflect our brand principles? How is this negatively going to reflect on the brand? Or does this contradict our mission and purpose altogether? It has been so hard. It has been so hard building Love Lexi. It is not for the faint of heart, especially being a mom of two young girls who are eight and 10. They come off the bus after school and I shut everything down and I try to be present. And then my husband comes home and then I open the laptop back up. You know, it is, it is an absolute grind. I will say that. I'm somehow making it work. Right, girls? Am I? Okay. But with these challenges and with the roadblocks, which, oh my goodness, have we experienced roadblocks, that could be a whole keynote of like, let's just highlight all the challenges Love Lexi has faced in the last year. There have been so many wins, and these are the wins that keeps us going. We did not hire a PR agency to get us press in the New York Times. We had journalists that reached out when they heard our story, and I had an, a serendipitous introduction to somebody who wanted to feature the story, so that's where we've gotten our press so far. Last year, we were the sponsor for the BODCON. It's an annual body confidence conference virtually. And Jax, the singer of Victoria's Secret, she was our keynote speaker on behalf of Love Lexi, which was really incredible. The Breasties, we're partners with them. They are a nonprofit organization that supports breast cancer warriors. Last year, we went to this four day camp in New York with their community. And even though it's not a journey that I had personally been on before with breast cancer, breast cancer um, knock on wood, it was the most moving experience to be there and we had a fitting tent and my director of product was there fitting our bras on some of the women and they would come out of the tent crying. It was the most beautiful moving experience ever and it's a partnership we're so proud to have. We were in North Shore Magazine among many other um, you know, local publications. Some other wins we've had, we have grown solely organic. I personally as a consumer am so tired of seeing ads so we haven't done any paid advertising yet. I wanna have our approach to be very different. Even when we step into paid marketing, it will not just be your typical ad, cookie cutter ad that you keep seeing on Instagram. Our reviews are phenomenal. We have women emailing us and DMing us on social media saying that we've made them cry, how much they love our brand and community. 
And I'm like, can you just go put that on the website? Because <laughs> it's a different app that we use on the website that captures like the post-purchase reviews. But it is incredible and so validating to just hear how excited our community is about this. And we're starting to gain traction finally after a year and a half of just grinding out and growing word of mouth. Again, growing community. These new partnerships we have coming this year are going to be huge for us. Um, we also have new styles and colorways. We have three new styles that we have in development currently. We're expanding our size range, as you know, currently to D. Eventually beyond that, again, dependent on capital. We have new colorways. We have a little bit more loungewear that's coming out more on the, the line of the Deer Body crew neck, but the demand for that has been so high, so we're bringing more colorways into the mix. I had already mentioned their downcycling program, and we are fundraising. Um, we have some angel investors that, again, add so much value, and they're so fun to be a part of our team. But just put it out there that the door is still open to any angel invest. We are still raising. Um, it's a really, really exciting time uh, for the brand. You may have heard this quote before, and I just have to say it again because it just, it really resonates. And you may be like, oh, this is so cliche, like a business motivational quote. But I'm convinced that about half of what separates successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful ones is pure perseverance. And again, back to my conversation I just had about the struggles we've been through, that is so real. I feel that. And that's why having confidence in yourself and having the resilience and strength to keep going is just, um, is a powerful thing to experience when you're in it. Um, and so that's been kind of like my guiding force, a guiding light, like just keep going. Just, even on the hard days, you just keep going. I gotta take a minute right now to give an unexpected shout out to my husband, Trevor. I don't think I'd be up here today if it wasn't for his, first of all, okay, I gotta be careful of what I say here because I could get emotional, but I won't. I'm gonna keep this kind of surface level. Just his support in making me feel beautiful through everything, always. He makes me feel amazing. But also for how much he supported this brand, I was literally like, so um, I'm gonna go all in with this brand now and I'm not gonna make a salary for a while. Like, you cool with that? He's just like, sure, you go, Meg. And he's up late stamping boxes, building boxes. He's just such a huge supporter. Can we all give a round of applause for to Trevor Smith? <laughs> and I can't go without giving a shout out to my daughters, Isla and Presley. Isla is 10, Presley is eight. They have been through this like pretty cool journey of watching mom build a business from the ground up. So there's been many times, right, girls, where they're like, Mom, why are you crying? And I'm like, girls, like, building a business is so hard. It's so hard, but it's such a cool experience for them to have at these ages, to be behind the scenes and see what it takes to build a big, beautiful, powerful brand and community. And then for them to be there and experience the wins and have them there helping me put stickers on packages in the fulfillment room and helping me organize inventory. It's just been an incredible journey to be a mom, but also to be a mom building a business with such amazing little cheerleaders. Can we give a round of applause for Isla and Presley? And thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Again, it's a pleasure um, and hope to meet you all after. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you. Would you consider getting your business either fair trade certified or B Corp certified? It's something I've certainly looked into. I looked into this at launch, you know, wanting to just be all the things and get all the certifications. Of course, I know there's a cost that comes with some of that. Um, so as soon as we're in a position to be able to invest and have the, the capital to get those certifications, that would be incredible for the brand. So yes. That'd be really cool. And I really like your message too. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Hi. I'm Jude Blake, we've spoken on the phone. I know and who I you are. I love your story. Um, but I did go on your website recently to try and buy your product and there was nothing available in my size. <gasps> how have how have out of stocks or you know sizes not being available has that taken a drain on your We've business? had exper that's a great question. Um, as of late, you know, we we do have a replenishment order 
that's in development currently, that's launching in April, but you're right. For the orders that come in or the requests that we get that, oh my gosh, my size isn't there. We just do our very best to like nurture you and be there for you in all the ways and hope that you're still sticking around when the time comes we have your size. Again, at being the scale we're at today, which is another reason why we're continuing to fundraise, like having those resources to just get bigger volumes in terms of what we're, we're pushing through production will allow us to just have more product available. Um, really quick story, we with the, the VETA plunge underwire, that was on pre-order for about nine months and it was supposed to be on pre-order for two months. It actually arrived finally when it was supposed to come in and there was a huge error in the cups. And it was like the most challenging, stressful thing to navigate, but luckily we did so without anyone wanting to return anything because they had already pre-ordered. Um, so it's really just that personability Right, like human to hu human being very honest about our process and when to expect product and just, again, hope that you stick around. That's a great question. Oh, yay, thanks, Jude. <laughs> Hi, um, I was just wondering, because you talked about it a little bit earlier about segmentation and how you're really trying to understand that consumer. Do you find those segments evolving as you expand your size range and like, what does that look like? That's a great question. Yes, they have evolved quite a bit. And currently when we look at our core customer segments, they really, a lot of them fit within our current size range that we offer. Um, initially when we launched, we had about six different customer persona groups. And again, at the scale that we're at and the size that we're at, we're working kind of with the data that we currently have and the exposure that we have um, to our growing community, right, to new consumers and where they're coming from. Um, so we've been able to refine those groups quite a bit to four solid persona groups, but we know that that will only continue to evolve. Um, Again, e even as we think of expanding our size set, right, the different lifestyles and experiences that these, uh, these other women might be going through that don't fit into the other customer segments, I mean, we're, we're open and, and nimble to keep growing and expanding those. So, great question. I hope I answered that. Um, hi. Uh, first, I hi. just want to thank you for being here. I loved your presentation. And Good. my question is just, if you could go back to when you first had the idea of the brand and, like, we're first launching your um, product, like is there any piece of advice that you would give yourself that might have changed the way that you did things completely? That's a really great question. And yes, absolutely. I wouldn't set the bar so high for myself. I knew what the opportunity was in the market and I knew what we were, ca what we were capable of doing at scale, but it was just myself and my product director. And I was literally prepping and planning for at launch, mind you, we had no like big pre pre-launch strategy. It was like posting on Instagram, growing this a little bit of hype. I was like, we're gonna sell out. We're gonna sell out overnight when we launch. You know, and I was just setting the bar so high. So when I wasn't hitting some of these like incredibly aggressive milestones, it was like, I almost felt like, you know, like it was a little bit of a hiccup, like I was set back. When in reality, what I've been able to achieve in the last year and a half is like, quite incredible when I, I speak to other founders and hear about other brands who it takes them five, 10 years to achieve some of the same things. So I'm being very mindful about the goals I set for myself and being way more realistic. Also time management. I almost hit burnout in my first year, which is a very real thing. Again, especially as being a mom, but any of you can experience burnout. And I would time block my day with so many different things it, that were, it was so unhumanly possible to, to get those things done. And again, I'd, I'd go to sleep at night incredibly stressed, feeling like I didn't quite do enough, you know, and um, it took a toll. So I, I had to kind of reset my, t my, my mindset and it's just been just clearly based on the trajectory that we've had in the last year, a much better way to be thinking about growing the business. So yeah, thanks for your question. Anyone else? Oh. Thank you. Uh, so you've been talking about conglomerates and brands that you said are your were existing rivals. Um, is anybody looking at you, and is you any, are you looking at them? And has anybody done anything in response to you? And do you ex if and if they haven't, do you expect them to? And what do you expect them to do? That's a great question. As of recently, apparently there are some of those brands that are using Love Lexi as like a keyword in AdWords. So like they see us, right? But in the bigger sense of, I've always heard of this warning that when you're in such a big market like that with such big conglomerates, they can squash you or try to squash you. And I actually had a, a conversation with um, one of our new product directors who's worked with, um, I won't say the brand names, but a really large brand. And that actually happened to them. A larger conglomerate came 
and told their suppliers basically that they can't supply for this brand anymore. So they were derailed. In the middle of product development and production, they could no longer access the pads and the materials that they needed to get their production running. And that other brand had the power to do that. And so I'm aware that these things can happen. And that's also why we're diversifying our factories, our suppliers. So we have multiple relationships with multiple suppliers, understanding that if, if one if we have an issue with one, we have a backup, or we can go here or there. I mean, again, I have incredible direct text relationships with my suppliers. Even though a lot of factories today will handle all of that for you and they'll source, which my factory does, I like to have direct communication to the CEO of that supplier. And so because I have that really special relationship and they believe in what we're building, I'm also hopeful that they would stay loyal to us in, in those situations. They see what we're doing and how we're shaking the industry. So we're bracing ourselves. I have my armor on. We'll see. Don't mess with me. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, everybody.